It's good to be in the pulpit with you. Indeed, these last two Sundays, it's been a delight to be with you again. It's wonderful to be in a sanctuary with people, to mingle and talk after the service, and to offer something of my life to a beloved congregation, not over Zoom or pre-recorded video, but live and in person. We humans, we humans are social creatures. We build the world we live in together. For good and for ill, we each contribute something to the collective whole. We can choose to do harm or we can choose to bless each other with our presence. If you've gathered here, I suspect you're here in part because you're seeking the blessing of community. Your presence brings that blessing into being. You bless each other when we assemble. When we are together, we can push back loneliness, off, offer each other comfort when hope is hard to find, and share our joy so that they spark all the more brightly. It should not be surprising, then, that I've enjoyed the social aspect of our regathering. After a prolonged isolation, it is so good to see your faces again and to be blessed by you. That is, of course, not to claim that there haven't been a few awkward moments. I know that I'm not alone in thinking that I have to lear relearn some social graces after more than a year when socializing has been a dangerous activity. Nonetheless, I've been finding the immediate feedback I've been getting after our services most helpful. I do not have to wonder whether I hit this point or I missed that one. Someone is, seems to be steadily willing to share with me and let me know. <laughs> Last week, uh, someone shared something, something with me after the second service in Channing Hall. They came up to me and let me know that they appreciated it, but they wanted me to know they had appreciated last week's service a little bit more. <laughs> Our first week back in the sanctuary, you might recall, I had structured my sermon around a phrase from the 42nd Psalm. I, each time I offered the words with joyous shouts of praise, I encouraged you to let everyone know that you are glad to be here. And many of you did. First Sunday back, we had a stronger uh, amen corner <laughs> than we've had in the before times. Now, the person who came to me to talk and came up to me to talk in Channing wanted me to know that they especially enjoyed that aspect of the service. They wanted it to be something more than just a one-off. Instead, they hoped that joyous shouts of praise would become ingrained in the culture of our congregation. <laughs> there we go. I agree, and I agree because when you respond to the sermon, you're emphasizing the fact that our gathering is an act of co-creation. Worship is something that we do together. Together in our gathering, we're building our community and blessing each other. Can I get an amen to that one? Amen. Pablo recognized our collective nature and his reflection on the nature of poetry. Writer and reader, he understood, engaged together who are reading my ode. You've used it against your own solitude. We've never met, and yet it's your hands that wrote these lines with mine. Itu, que leas mi odia contra tu soledad la has dirigido y así tus propias manos la escribieron sin conocerme con las manos mías we are social creatures until we read them Neruda's words on his page are just meaningless ink it's only once you or I give them eye or throat that his letters begin to mean anything at all a ship on the sea isn't the only image of its beauty. It flies over water like a dove, end product of wondrous collaborations. 
This world we live in, like this service we offer, is an act of constant co-creation. I bring my part into being, you bring yours, together we form some of what is. I offer you these reflections as I make my way to the line of text upon which I wish to hinge today's sermon. It comes from the writer of speculative fiction, Ursula Le Guin. She used her many novels to point to a simple truth about our world. Things can be different than they are. Deeply immersed in anthropology and history, she knew another truth. Things have been different than they are now. In one of her speeches, she provided the sentence to which we now turn. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. But then, so did the divine right of kings. Now there's a lot happening in that sentence. It's filled with big ideas. It offers a social critique. It suggests the possibility of hope. For Le Guin, her sentence names the system she thought of as the source of, shall I call it evil? She names the, the system that she understood to be behind a great deal of human suffering and the driving engine behind the climate catastrophe. You may not agree with Le Guin's naming. You might not agree with your preacher's persistent criticisms of the same economic system. I'm not going to worry about that a great deal. Instead, I will point you to our earlier hymn, we saying we will all do our own naming. I'm offering you Le Guin's naming to suggest something that transcends the particularity of our predicament in my preacherly analysis. I'm offering it as a reminder that over time we humans have created a great deal of social systems. Throughout human history, these social systems have crested and fallen like waves on the ocean. However we want to name it, the social system is changing. We're at an inflection point, caught in what Johanna Macy has called optimistically, perhaps, the great turning. We're at the threshold of social change. As catastrophic forest fires and floods attest, the climate is continuing to warm rapidly. As the journalist David Roberts re wrote recently, there is no moderate position on climate change. Either we act rapidly and at a massive scale to avoid the worst catastrophes, or we suffer the worst consequences. Either outcome involves radical change. There's no avoiding radicalism. The world we live in is changing. We are changing it. Changing it so much that some geologists have argued that we need to recognize we've entered into a new geological epoch. They call it the Anthropocene, the human epoch. In the Anthropocene, we humans are not only responsible for shaping our societies, we're responsible for shaping the planet itself. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. For the rest of the sermon, I want to focus less on the social critique Le Guin offers her naming and more on the second two clauses. Its power seemed inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. These two clauses are meant to remind us that our social systems have changed before, and so it is possible to imagine that they will change again. For hundreds of years, the divine right of kings, the idea that the monarch was specially anointed by God to rule, was an almost unchallengeable idea. In the 7th century, 17th century, the English Parliament had the belief so ingrained that the body began its every assemblage with an utterance of the speaker, that kings were visible gods and God an invisible king. In fact, the divine right of kings was so taken for granted that when members of Parliament were rebuked by the royal personages, it was not, in, it was not uncommon for them to respond entirely without sarcasm. Because the king is a god upon earth, I would answer him as we should answer God in heaven, that is, with a prayer. This idea was not universally accepted. 
We have pamphlets from radicals which contain proclamations like, it is undoubtedly lawful for the people to resist the king, for the people's power is higher, yea, the supreme power. And we have lyrics from subversive ballads promising, the poor shall wear the crown. Over time, the ideas of the radicals became commonplace. Over time, the idea of the divine right of kings started to be viewed as anachronistic, absurd. Over time, the social system changed. Now this, of course, is a gross oversimplification. It excludes much blood, sweat, and tears. The divine right of kings did not go quietly or gently into that good night. But it did go. And I could stand here and tell you how and why it went. I could offer you the history of that transformation, speak of the English Civil War and the French Revolution, could tell the stories of the American and Haitian revolutions too. Perhaps we might linger upon a quote by Toussaint Louverture, the Haitian revolutionary who declared, it could only be kings who dare claim the right to reduce into servitude men made like them and whom nature has made free. But I'll save such a lengthy discourse for another forum. Instead, I want to lift up this point. We humans create the social systems, the economic and political systems in which we live. We have the power to imagine and then bring into being different ways of being than we have now. In fact, one of the purposes of our religious communion is to offer a place for such imaginings. Radical talk, you might think. But such a claim rests solidly upon the theological bedrock of Unitarian Universalism. Indeed, such a claim bespeaks much of what makes our tradition what it is. Back in the 16th and 17th centuries, the congregations that became Unitarian Universalists emerged in opposition to the theological idea that humanity has no power to shape its own destiny. Many pulpits were then filled with performances inspired by the theology of John Calvin. He utterly rejected the idea that we humans are free in any way to choose our own destiny. Instead, he taught a doctrine called predestination. This is the belief that, in Calvin's words, God has determined himself whatever he wished to happen to each and every man. He paired this with a belief in what he named the depravity of our nature. This was a claim that humans are fundamentally evil and incapable of bringing any good into the world separate from what God wills for them. Unitarian theologians like William Ellery Channing rejected Calvin's belief on both counts. Instead of preaching about human depravity, Channing taught that we all contain within the likeness to God. With this likeness inside, he argued, we are gifted with the possibility of nurturing the spark of the divine so that it might shine ever more brightly. Whether or not we nurtured that spark was ours to choose. It was not foreordained that I would fail to let it gleam brightly, and you would let your spark dazzle and flare. What happens is tied to the choices we make. Channing's theology helped inspire a generation of social reformers, people brave enough to believe that the world that they lived in could be different than it was. They inhabited a world where chattel slavery was the norm and where women did not have the right to vote or even speak in public. They, ima they imagined the abolition of slavery. They imagined the rights of women, and their imaginings helped to bring those things into being. Again, I find myself offering oversimplifications, trying to reduce so much history, so much theology, so much bravery into a few sentences. The point I am attempting to bring us to, though, is this. We co-create, bring into being, the world we inhabit. We social creatures create our society. The world is not foreordained. We can build a different society than the one we presently inhabit. We can imagine a new world into being. Indeed, this is the only thing that has ever happened. In society, all that is for us began as an idea, a twinkling, a dream. This sanctuary in which we worship, 
was started as a conversation between congregation and architect some generations ago. The pews upon which those of you who are here with me in the sanctuary sit, the pulpit from which I am preaching, all ideas carved into wood. The same is true for those of you who are watching our service via live stream. The silicon chips, the camera lenses, the speakers, and the audio equipment all began as ideas before materials were manufactured and brought them into their present form. What is true of our physical human creations is true of our social ones as well. Religion, this act in which we are collectively engaged, takes many forms. Go across the street to First Presbyterian and you'll see something quite different in the sanctuary than you do here at First Houston. If you could go back in time to ancient Egypt, you'd see something quite different there. And if you choose to visit a mosque or a synagogue or a Hindu temple, you'll encounter other forms of religious expression in them as well. We live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. I'm offering you these words this week as we are caught in a great turning for the simple reason that as your minister, I'm called upon to offer you hope. Hope might be hard to find. The climate crisis is dire. The hour is late. If only a few years to avert the worst of what might come. But hope is not unjustified. We humans have changed society before. We are no longer ruled by a monarch who believes himself to be ordained by an all-powerful deity. And so we have the possibility of changing it again. Catastrophe is not foreordained. As a human society, we will choose what comes next. But catastrophe or something else, we will be the ones who make the choice. We will decide either to imagine an outcome where we avert the overwarming of the planet or we will not. We really do have that power. Now, I'm not promising that the radical changes that must be made to ward off the worst will be easy. I'm not even telling you that they will occur. There are grave forces in place, forces and structures that we all participate in, which want to tilt us to the radicalism of despair, the belief that we cannot stop what is coming and that we cannot choose differently. I'm just trying to offer you the radicalism of hope and remind you that hard as it is to imagine, we as a human species have the power to choose our collective fate. In our closing hymn, we will sing, We are of the Spirit, truly of the Spirit. Only can the Spirit turn the world around. Whether you identify as atheist, theist, pagan, Buddhist, Christian, just plain Unitarian Universalist, or something else, let me suggest that the words of our hymn affirm in an indirect or metaphoric way, the message of this sermon. It is not the material forces of the world that ultimately determine what happens. Fire, water, and mountain are all very important and very powerful. But in the end, it is the spirit, the ideas, the imaginings, the dreams that empowers us to bring things into being. The world is not foreordained. In the hopes that we will all remember this, I invite the congregation to say, Amen. Amen.